The Creative Lab Sound Blaster 16, model CT1740, is a card we're probably all familiar with, and whilst it does work, we're probably also familiar with its numerous shortcomings, of which there is no shortage of. So, what did the competition have to offer? This video is about the MediaVision Pro Audio Spectrum 16. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and this video is about the MediaVision Pro Audio Spectrum 16. We're going to put it against the Creative Lab Sound Blaster 16, as both cards have pretty similar features, they're from round about the same time. They were certainly in competition with one another, so we'll have a listen to what they sound like and have a look at the build quality of them. As I said, they're, they're fairly similar on paper, so one of them may come out on top, or maybe they'll be too close as we can't really tell much difference. I think with audio it's somewhat subjective, so coming to a definitive conclusion, and this is going to be hard. One brief warning is that I can't really measure the noise floor effectively, but I'll explain more about that at the end. If you're wondering throughout why I don't really mention that so much, then, well, yeah, like I said, I'll talk about it at the end of this video. But for now, let's get on with this before this gets dragged out. We're going to try and cover pretty much what we can about the card, rather than the company who made it, but in case you're not familiar with MediaVision, I'll go over that briefly here. MediaVision were founded in 1990, it's a good year, seemingly by people from a range of different companies. Some of them even came over from Video 7 of all places. They quickly established themselves as competent sound card makers, with the Pro Audio Spectrum and Thunderboard line, and hailing from California, proudly displayed Made in the USA on some of their boards and in their marketing. They also introduced the Video 1 codec, the de facto compression for many video files on Microsoft Windows at the time. If you ever played those Welcome AVI files from the Windows 95 CD, then yeah, MediaVision are the ones who wrote the codec that that's using. Microsoft just bought the rights to it later on. The company grew rapidly, and may have been the only real threat to Creative Labs, but MediaVision were allegedly committing financial fraud, and unfortunately for the rest of us, the company's long since defunct. I'm not going to try and hide my bias in this video, so don't expect me to. I'm just telling you now, that's completely out the window. You'll probably figure out which way I'm leaning with these two cards very quickly. So our focus today is on this card, the Pro Audio Spectrum 16, and we're going to be pitting it against the Sound Blaster 16 from Creative Labs. Looking at them side by side, there are definite similarities. They're roughly the same size, they both seem to use a 4-layer PCB, though I think MediaVision probably did this first, given how good they were with component integration and such. Both cards offer 16-bit CD quality audio, 44.1 kilohertz, and I think you may be able to push things a little farther if you start being experimental. They also both offer a Yamaha FM synthesizer chip, a real YMF262, and both of them provide an interface for a CD-ROM drive, and were sometimes sold in multimedia kits with a drive included. The differences start to become more clear here, as it appears Creative favoured the Panasonic MKE interface, whereas MediaVision usually provided SCSI. The both cards were available with a variety of different interfaces if you wanted something different. These just seem to be the most common. One advantage to the SCSI interface is that you can actually plug in devices such as hard drives, and they'll work, you can use them, but you won't be able to boot from them as the card has no bias for this purpose. It just accesses the drives when the drive has started in an operating system, so yeah, you won't be using it that way, but you can certainly plug a variety of things in there, and yeah, I, I guess MediaVision probably made the better decision here, at least in my opinion, especially as it gives you more room to upgrade later. CD-ROM drives had used SCSI for years, and well, as we know, they're, they're still kind of using it, and this 50-pin interface was around for around a decade after this card was made, so yeah, much better upgrade path, MKE was long since dead by then. 
The amplifier circuitry is also quite different on both cards, with the Pro Audio Spectrum featuring a beefy 4 watt amplifier and the Sound Blaster offering a substantially weaker option of an unknown power. It isn't very loud, so I can't imagine there being more than 1 or 2 watts that it can shove on a good day, whereas a Pass 16 can easily blow up small passive speakers or puny cheap headphones if you start being silly with it, which is rather nice. Probably is worth remembering that a lot of people were using passive speakers at the time, so having the ability to crank them up loud as hell is quite cool. A lot of cards really don't get that much volume out of them, no matter how far you ramp the volume up, assuming you even had access to a control and a mixer at all. The connectors on the PCB do differ slightly, at the rear, the PAS-16 uses metal jacks, which at least give the impression of higher quality, even though they likely offer no advantage over the plastic ones that the SB-16 uses. The SB-16 has a physical volume controller, whereas the PAS-16 prefers to use software for this feature. Really depends which way you prefer doing it here, I guess. Both cards also offer a game and MIDI port. Internally, both of them have a CD audio header, which may vary in its pinout and style depending on the CD-ROM interface your card offered. You might not have to use this at all on the PAS-16 though, because the card can read CD audio data directly through its SCSI interface if you have the SCSI version. Seems to depend which drive you've got plugged into it somewhat, but this does eliminate the requirement for using that little cable in such circumstances. And I guess it could get rid of some analog noise. The PAS-16 sometimes has one extra connector for an additional line level input source. I guess you'd call this an auxiliary connector. It does appear to share its mixer line with the rear input jack, but you can use both of them at the same time, unlike, say, the Soundscape S2000, so yeah, there's not really anything to worry about here. It, it's pretty nice to have this option, and I am using it on mine. A rather interesting feature difference is that the SB-16 offers a PC speaker input, where the PAS-16 offers a PC speaker output. Yeah, this this is an output, it doesn't plug into the signal on the motherboard, and you don't want to plug it in there because the amplifier will blow up. I've seen too many cards with holes burned in them because of people doing this and not reading the manual. What's happening here is that the SB-16 plugs into the PC speaker header on your motherboard, where the speaker would usually plug in, and mixes the signal into the audio. The PAS-16 doesn't plug into here. Instead, it sniffs the ISA bus for the signal directly, and it doesn't need a cable. How this is achieved is that the PC speaker is driven by a programmable interval timer, which sits on the ISA bus. So MediaVision opted to simply listen at the address this device sits at. This completely eliminates the need for any such cable, and probably eliminates quite a lot of noise as well, as that speaker header usually has quite a lot of noise coming off of it. On both cards you may have to enable these features, as it seems they are muted by default in the mixer. The speaker header on this card instead goes to an actual speaker. You can just plug in the one from the case that would usually go to the motherboard and drive it from the card instead. If nothing's plugged into the rear output jack, then sound will play through this internal case speaker. There's also no getting around the fact that Creative used relatively cheap components that weren't really the best of quality, where MediaVision made a card that you only have to look at to see the quality is much higher. It's heavier, the solder mask is just better, it's smoother, it's shinier, and the capacitors were almost always Nichicon or another Japanese brand, so you know they weren't fucking around with this thing. Also, the backplane shield is really shiny. I don't know why, but I've noticed cards which have these, like, super shiny backplane shields like this are usually either something exotic or something that's really good quality. I don't know why that's a thing, but yeah, it's a pattern I've noticed over the years. I guess there's no guarantee of this, but, well, it's, it may be a good indicator to look for. I think that covers the physical aspects of the board, so now installing them. Well, we already know where all the cables go, so that was easy enough. Also, both cards use a single 16-bit ISA slot, like pretty much every other sound card from their time. 
The software for DOS and Windows 3.1 also installs relatively easily on both cards. In fact, the installation isn't hugely dissimilar. The, there's a slight trade-off. The same Blaster 16 uses jumpers to set up its address, IRQ, DMA, things like that. Whereas the PAS 16 uses a software configuration which you can change at any time simply by editing the config sys. You don't even have to go in the setup program again if you don't want to. It's somewhat subjective as to which you prefer, but Media Vision's way seems a little more forward thinking, and it means you don't have to take the lid off your case if your settings don't work and you need to change them later on. This is quite annoying doing that just to fiddle with an interrupt or something that you're having problems with that you didn't really foresee at the time you put the card in. I mean, things like that might not even rear their head immediately, Although the installer does test for availability of resources when you try to set them, and it seems quite reliable. I've never had it lock up or say something's in use that isn't. I mean, that's possible on certain motherboards, obviously, but yeah, it's uh, it seems to work really well, this thing. I'm surprised. I'm thinking of things like Gravis's installer. That's a total mess and often just messes you around, says, oh, you can't use this, this is in use when it isn't, or this is free when it's not, and then you end up with an infinite loop of a sample playing. Yeah, that just doesn't seem to happen. The Media Vision wrote this thing pretty damn well. It's watertight. You can probably see the MPU emulation options, and I won't be testing that, because I just don't have a way to test them satisfactorily. I, I'm not happy with what I can test. I've never run into any of the issues people report with the Sound Blaster 16, so as I can't recreate problems that people have reported with cards over the years, I can't really compare these two short of saying that, well, they've both worked with everything I've tried to do with them, but maybe I'm just lucky and I'm doing things that aren't generally a problem. As I don't appear to have anything affected by the aforementioned issues, such as the hanging notebook, Please don't take my word for it that these work, and instead just consider these features completely untested here. Hmm, whilst I wouldn't use this feature, I know it probably does mean something to somebody. That the Sound Blast has a wavetable header, where the Pro Audio Spectrum doesn't, so that might swing your decision a little bit. As I say, I personally wouldn't use this, I'd use the port on the back, and... Most of these wavetables that fit on these things, are, I don't really like the sound of that much. Which is why I use the Turtle Beach Maui in my Pentium. Sounds better, and it doesn't run on a header. And I loop it back into the AUX header, which is something the Sound Blaster doesn't have. Now, the gap opens up very quickly. Creative software is rather bare burns. Their DOS mixer works but it's not a patch on Media Vision's one, which can save multiple profiles and easily be operated from the command line without you ever having to go in the interface. Although if you want the interface, just type pass and an asterisk from anywhere in DOS, and it'll come up. It's also integrated with the Windows Mixer, where you can opt to have them either inherit each other's settings in either direction or not at all, and have them completely independent of one another. Media Vision tracks especially well under Windows, as you have much more to play with. Creative just gave you this basic mixer, which does work, mostly. I've never seen the LED display move, but, well, it's a mixer, and it does set the volume levels for things on the card. It, it does so satisfactorily. But Media Vision gave you two mixers, a wave file player and recorder, as well as a rather nice CD player. And you'll notice a difference in window size and the amount of options you have. Yeah, this is efficient UI design. This is how a user interface should be designed. Developers today should take a leaf out of this book. I mean, nowadays, look how much space the Windows mixer, which isn't even a, a real mixer, takes up on the screen. And think how much of a higher resolution you're running that at compared to this old machine. Look how much they managed to fit in here, and, and it's still coherent. It makes sense. Like, this is how you should do it. Even the creative mix has beaten the crap out of modern software design. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you were aware, but if you just want to change the master volume, you don't even need to open the mixer on the uh, Pro Audio Spectrum. You just need to hold Ctrl-Alt-U and Ctrl-Alt-D, and it'll turn the volume up or down, respectively. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I like that. It's like multimedia keys before multimedia keys. 
the differences in the audio also quickly present themselves under Windows because Creative uses the more common patch set for the FM synthesizer that seems to just be the stock thing that always comes with Windows, where MediaVision use the Voyetra patches by default. Although the driver gives you the option to change them if you can find more, which uh, isn't something I have around, then again you could supposedly tamper with the Sound Blaster 16 to use Voyetra patches with that card too, but we're leaving as many things on default as possible here to keep a level playing field. We're just assuming you're installing this and running everything as you found it, so... Yeah, I, I don't want to tweak things. I, I won't be playing with turn pots or anything in this. I'm just leaving everything alone. Yeah, we have a, a curious situation where I've noticed that the default mixer values for the Sound Blaster 16 set pretty much all of the sources higher by default than the Pro Audio Spectrum 16 does, so yeah, by default it's going to ramp the volume of individual sources up higher above the noise floor, I guess. Of course, how loud that noise floor is, is uh, anybody's guess. I, I think we know which card's going to be the noisier of the two. But yeah, under default conditions, I might just sway it a little bit. Uh, probably a cheap trick by Creative. I'd imagine they were aware of just how noisy their card was, and that's probably why they've ramped it up. I'm not hiding my bias, and it's not not even bias. It's just a, a fact that the Sound Blaster 16 is noisy. Everybody knows it's it's bloody noisy, and I reckon that's probably why they've defaulted the values higher than Media Vision did. It's just a, an interesting thing that that's worth noting here, I think. Nonetheless, here's a brief comparison of these two patch sets. is continue in DOS where the PC speaker sounds are radically different to one another, so it seems that sniffing the PIT signals from the ISA bus produces a noticeably different result to mixing the signal from the header. I don't really have a preference here, but let's listen to the two cards. Yeah, there's, uh, it's, it's a very distinct difference. You wouldn't be able to confuse these two for one another, I don't think. If you if you got in used to one way, you would, you'll definitely be able to tell that there's, there's a difference here. And if you knew both cards, you'd be able to pick out which one was which, I'm sure. Whilst we're running Commander Keen, let's have a listen to the two FM synths working here. Maybe we should try it with Duke Nukem 2.
further you push it, the more apparent the differences are, such as with this module. hear the waves phasing differently in places. Most prominently is probably here. This highlights something that emulators wouldn't be able to give you, the subtle differences in supporting circuitry. I don't know which of these two implementations is technically the more correct, but it's quite interesting given how both cards use the exact same FM chip. So they should make the same waveform, there should be no difference. Yet, even in an audio editor, there's a blatantly huge difference in the shape of things. Did I mention that most of this stuff will be included as FLAC file recordings in the description for you to look at yourself if you want to investigate this? Yeah, I figured you might want to look at that. Somebody somewhere is going to want to. Hmm. Now, I've done a little bit of perking around, and I have a suspicion as to why this FM chip might sound different. My bet would be that the cards are supplying them with a slightly different clock to each other. That would be my guess, just going by the crystals that were around. So, I don't know. Also, the MediaVision card doesn't seem to have what I believe is the Yamaha companion deck. So maybe they integrated that into one of these ICs that they built here, or that they had built. Because, well, they were good at integrating things like that, and wouldn't at all surprise me if that is something they would do. Again, I don't know which implementation would technically be more correct with the sound it's producing. <laughs> I don't really have much of a way to test. The thing with the, the Yamaha 262, it's kind of a wonky turn generator anyway. Just FM synthesis in general is pretty wonky, if I'm honest. It's uh, it's not my preferred method of synthesis if I have to work with something, you know. But yeah, that's uh, a thought. It's uh, a consideration. I, I, I suspect that's what's going on. But it's unconfirmed, and I don't really have the tools to measure it, unfortunately. If somebody does, and they're curious enough, I'd love to know your results if you started perking these around with a scope. It'd be kind of interesting to know what came out. I think it's 14.32 MHz, I think it wants the 262. And supposedly it'll change the pitch slightly if you move it, at least if it's anything like the 2151 that the DX100 uses, which is more like the 2612 that's in the Mega Drive, in effect. But, yeah, uh, I'm getting way too nerdy, I think, even for this channel now, so I'll stop. For PCM, the PAS-16 is not directly compatible with the Sound Blaster, which is unfortunate, but a solution was offered, in the form of including the chip from MediaVision's earlier Thunderboard, a Sound Blaster-compatible card, on the Pro Audio Spectrum 16. Unfortunately, this means that games with only Sound Blaster support will have you limited to only 8-bit mono sound, as with most alternative cards of the time, but it should be at least good 8-bit mono sound. It's probably going to sound far better than any creative card could ever hope to achieve with 8-bit mono audio anyway. In fact, I'd wager that a lot of the time it even sounds better than creative boards doing 16-bit audio. Also, it's worth remembering that most games at this time only used 8-bit audio samples anyway, and the mixing in their sound system was usually quite rough. Nonetheless, we shall listen to a couple of Sound Blaster only games here. Firstly, Nightmare 3D. <laughs>
and also Duke Nukem 2. I am back. Oh yeah, this card works in Duke Nukem 2, so it definitely passes the compatibility test as far as that goes. Although, there will surely be something that it doesn't work with. Hey, th there are a bunch of older games that don't even work with the Sound Blaster 16, so pick your poison. You I don't think you're ever going to get 100% compatibility in this time period, no matter which card you choose. You'll just have to make compromises somewhere, and it's up to you. It's probably worth noting that Duke Nukem 2 actually seems happier on this card running under Windows 3.1 as opposed to on DOS itself. It'll work either way, but I've had better results running it under Windows, which is a little bit strange, but I figured it was worth pointing out because, well, I've played this for hours and hours and it hasn't crashed, which certainly suggests Media Vision's Windows drives are stable, which is certainly something that wasn't a given with devices around this time. Yeah, running something in Windows was still a bit of a novel thing. A lot of drivers weren't that good back then, and, well, Media Vision certainly seemed to have got their stuff sorted out. This thing just works. Of course, the best case scenario is when a game actually supports the card properly out of the box, such as Dark Forces. The Emperor has approved your test demonstration, General Mock. Thank you, Lord Vader. What I unveil today will mark a new era for the Empire. We will be able to decimate the Rebels just as we did the Jedi Knights. At last, the Emperor's war will be filled only with the glory and beauty of decisive victory. A noble cause, General. I hope the demonstration lives up to your claims. Proceed. With pleasure. Dark Trooper, release. Listen to that 16-bit mixing. There's no crunchiness in the quiet spots. And whilst I'm not really able to demonstrate as well as I'd like here, there is a much lower noise floor on the past 16 overall. If you're still not hearing a difference, let's try playing some PCM files under Windows. These are 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz files. So I think that's about it. If you want more lengthy comparison, then I'll leave you to download the recordings and perk them around at your leisure. But that's basically it for these two cards. We've seen them, we've heard them. I'm sure the differences are still quite evident, even after the YouTube compression has had an effect on this. Sound is somewhat subjective, so which one is better really is up to you, I guess. The I'm making no effort here to hide the fact that I prefer the Pro Audio Spectrum 16 by a hell of a long way. I just feel that it treats you a lot better. It has these little finishing touches that the Creative Labs cards just can't give you. And these are features which I use. I use the included software. I find myself using the keyboard shortcut for volume quite a lot. So for me, it's just the right card. It, it does things a lot better for me personally but your mileage may vary. Still, I don't hear it talked about as much as other cards, and I think that's a shame, because this thing was relevant. I mean, hell, you could be had cheaper than a Sound Blaster 16 at times. It seemed to vary depending on what week you looked and who was selling it, but this thing really should have done a lot better than it did. It did well. It was probably the second biggest card versus the Sound Blaster 16 for sales, but man, I would have loved to have seen this thing win. I think we'd probably be a lot better off today if it had. Well, that's that. I don't think there's too much more to do here. I mean, there's other things I could do. I could try playing CDs through them. 
could try recording through the line input, which I did think of doing, but I don't think too many people care about that. Short answer is the past 16 is better. It's uh, going to do a better job on recording than a Sound Blaster 16. The Sound Blaster 16 sounds really crushed. The, the past has compared to newer cards, but I mean, it's going to. Look how old the damn thing is. You know, it's 16-bit uh, sound was brand new on PCs at the time, really. I think it had been done before in studios, but yeah, never like this. So, you know, it was kind of a new thing. They did very well. Now, the issues I said at the start with noise ended up not being as much of a problem as I thought they did. I, I decided to just bite the bullet and get the NX586 to work uh, as it should. If you can hear a clicking, I'm, I'm actually restoring the drive image in the background now, and I'm hoping the hard drive will last out, because I've still got some things to record. I'm, I'm speaking sort of to the future, assuming everything's worked. But some things won't work on the NX586, uh, who would have thought? It won't run Duke 3D, that was originally meant to be part of this video, because ASS supports the Pro Audio Spectrum, but then again it's ASS, the support's going to be terrible anyway. No matter what card it is, it just uses the same crap mono ad-lib driver, things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of shit. And Duke 3D only uses 8-bit samples anywhere, as did most games. That's the thing you've got to remember. Games that only support the Sound Blaster probably only use 8-bit mono audio anywhere. And you're not losing too much in losing the stereo for me, because the games were so simple. Games that used more higher quality audio, usually written later, they'll probably support the Pro Audio Spectrum a lot of the time. Some of them don't, but what you can get, you're going to get higher quality sound usually. I honestly think it does sound better than the actual Sound Blaster at emulating a Sound Blaster. Which, again, it's subjective, it's audio, but a lot of the time I do feel it has the edge. Still, some of the things I, it, it does, I can't do on the next gen. I can't do the PC speaker sniffing, which I don't believe is anything to do with the CPU speed limit. There is a speed limit to the CPU you can do this with. I don't know where it tops out, because I don't know that it's the CPU speed limit kicking in, or the next gen just been weird. It's probably the next gen been weird. As I said, a lot of things don't work on it, so... It, even 386 stuff doesn't quite work on it a lot of the time. It's sort of like some enhanced 286. It's like a 32-bit 286 due to all the missing instructions it seems to have. So I can't do the PC speaker sniffing. I've run it in fast Pentiums and it's been fine, so I don't know why there's a problem on that. Uh, I mean, by the time you get to like Pentium X and Pentium 2, I've not tested. It might not work by then, that feature, but by then, this card's really old compared to those machines. There's like 97, 98 machines. This is like 93 technology. You want to know 64 or Yamaha 724 in machines like that, really. So, yeah, anyway, that stuff was done in my Pentium, but obviously the noise floor in my Pentium 66, we keep seeing the Pentium 66, and I don't mean it to be that way, it's just that the thing's so damn dependable, it always works, so it always ends up having to come out and work. I can depend on it, so it gets used, that's how it is. Uh, so we had to do that on there, but obviously we've got like a capture card and a wavetable card and the MPEG decoder, which is stuck to the video card, all basically leeching off of it. It's sandwiched between a, a network card somewhere. It, it's, uh, yeah, that, that system's very cramped and there's a lot of things in proximity to that sound card they're going to raise a noise floor no matter what you put in there. So that might be a bit noisy. Uh, the MIDI playback in Windows I had to do on the Pentium 66 because it just doesn't work on the next gen for reasons unknown. I can't figure it out. Even if I copy the, the configuration files and everything it just doesn't work on there. I, I don't understand it. I've said before, it, it has weird issues with interrupts and DMA, the next gen from what I can tell. It, probably something to do with that. So I don't really know. I, I can't be certain. But yeah, we had to do that on there. We had to do one or two things on there. I'll mark it out in the included audio samples in the archive, in the description, if you want to analyze these things yourself. So then, 
you know, you'll know those ones, they're not a far comparison of noise because they were done in a different machine and every machine is going to have its own noise floor. I mean, when we look at card proximity in the next gen, the, the sound card's miles away from anything. So, you know, obviously you're going to get less noise. In theory, the machine's got less in it, the sound card's farther away. So, yeah, a uh, bit unfortunate we had to do that, but sometimes you have to do these things. You notice a lot of the footage of Windows stuff uh, is on the Pentium 66. And it, again, it's because it doesn't work on the next gen. I don't know why. I don't know if it's just my copy of it or what, but I wouldn't factor that in as a compatibility issue with the card. That that machine is... that CPU just doesn't really play ball with a lot of stuff, so we'll ignore that. We won't really yell at it too much. Still, that's enough wittering. We know where we are with it now. It's obvious which one I prefer. I prefer the Pro Audio Spectrum. There's going to be some games somewhere that don't work with it, I'm sure. I've not really run into that sort of problem. But if that's a concern, then yeah, it's, it's valid. The compatibility is probably up there with the best of them, but there's going to be some of that doesn't work. Then again, on the real Sound Blaster 16, there's going to be some stuff that doesn't work. Even between one Sound Blaster and another, there are compatibility issues. But yeah, okay. Those weird few games that don't work are more likely to work on the Sound Blaster, I guess. So, do you want the guarantee of compatibility, or do you want a slight sacrifice for some extra quality, I think is the question. And even then, what's your idea of quality? You like might like the mud of the Sound Blaster 16. I mean, hell, I can appreciate money noise. I listen to 90s Eurodance, but, you know, I've got like this Akai sampler. And if, if you want real Eurodance noises, you can't turn everything up. Oh, we'll have the maximum sound bandwidth available. It's going to sound shit, because it's going to sound really clean. You need to turn it on, turn the sample rate as low as it'll go, save on, on disk space. And it's probably because they used to store everything on floppy disks and they didn't want to pay for them. And so they probably cranked it down so they could store more. It sounds muddy as shit, but it's the authentic sound, so... Yeah, you might prefer the Sound Blaster 16, and I urge you to download the archive and have a listen to things. I don't know if they'll sync up on the timeline if you were to put the Pass recording and the Sound Blaster recording next to each other. The subtle timing differences between cards, and definitely between machines with the stuff we had to do on the Pentium, I'm sure. But you can hear things side by side, and there's a very pronounced difference a lot of the time. There's there's different things that are emphasised and de-emphasised between both cards. Uh, vocals seem to... like female vocals seem to get muted out a lot on the SB16, whereas they're more clear on the pass, but then you've, you've got hi-hats sort of come in a little bit hard and things like that. It's, it's, it's really odd how the, the analogue circuitry on them's tuned quite differently. Love to have seen it do better. It's, it's a shame the company had to stumble and fuck up, because I'm sure everybody's evading tax and stuff, it's just they're better at getting away with it. Yeah, it's a shame they're the ones who had to get caught out. I would have loved to see Creative die. Creative don't know shit about audio. It's, it's clear, they just make the card work, they make it as cheap and shit as possible and get it out the door. I never liked Sound Blasters, really. They're, the quality is just bad. The, they work, I use them because they're a necessary evil, but if I can find an alternative, I will use the damn alternative. And that's what I'm doing with this thing, as I wouldn't put no filthy sound blaster in my, my Pentium 66. I'd rather be like, you know what, sod it, we might lose a bit of compatibility in some game I'm not playing. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's better for me. And the, the software that it comes with is better. It, I use the software that it comes with, and it's some beautiful UI design. I mean, look how much little space it takes up, and yet it's still big enough to be usable with the mouse. It all makes sense, it's all consistent, and it's useful. I use the stuff all the time. It's like, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. The Windows drivers, the thing is, when it comes to Windows, there is no contest. Like, in DOS, you've got this, ah, oh, well, the compatibility, ah, oh, well, the this, the that. You know, you've got a bit of an argument for the SB16. In Windows, poof, disappears completely. There is just no competition from the SB16. The PASS just integrates better. It has better software. It has a better driver. Like, you can game in, like, a Windows 3.1 DOS box. The, the drivers will never fail. 
I've never had them crash. I've sat there for hours and hours. I've all tabbed in and out, which is bad juju on Windows 3.1 because they hadn't quite got the hang of this shit yet. And that's the thing. I don't think people had got the hang of writing Windows drivers yet. Media Vision hit the nail on the head. I've never had a problem with them. Hell, if something goes wrong, it doesn't just bring up an ambiguous error. It actually has graceful error handles. Like if the card isn't detected, I've not really seen anything else do that. It's, they did fantastically well with this. I, I am really genuinely impressed, even all these years on. I've, I've been using the Pro Audio Spec from a few years, and the drivers, the stability of them, how well they integrate, how well they work, it just continues to impress me. Because, yeah, people use the same stuff all the time now because they know it works, and that's a sensible thing to do. If you know something works, then that's what you should probably do if you want to get something done. But a lot of devices at that time, their Windows drivers were really bad, especially early on. Like they, The ones you have now are probably like later versions of drivers where they'd fix things. The past drivers, man, in Windows 3.1, they, they work better. Everything about in Windows 3.1 it just obliterates the Sound Blaster. There's, there's no ifs or buts about it in that regard. And like I say, I actually think the compatibility is slightly better in uh, DOS on Windows. Uh, if you have problems sometimes, I've noticed, you'll get a better result doing that, and it does work. It, I, I don't know, man. I, I genuinely do think it's the better card of the two. Uh, my last thing that I want to remark upon a little more is the wavetable header. I don't use those, so I'm not really, I can't bash the pass for it, because it doesn't have one, but I think they're a waste of money. I really think they're a waste of money, unless there's something really special you want to put on there. Wavetable cards in general, I'm a little bit mm, touchy about them, because a lot of them aren't very good, as we've seen. We've heard that soundscape sounds crap. We've heard the Turtle Beach Pinnacle it sounds pretty crap. It's not too bad, it's far from the worst, but it's not real great, and in all honesty, I don't really like the sound of the gust that much. It doesn't, after hearing the Maui, the gust sounds like a sort of poor man's version of it, and... Mm, don't know, I'm, I'm not that keen, it's not bad, it has a charm, but there's definitely better stuff out there. And that's the thing, if it's, an, it's a, a really novel thing like the Maui, I'm happy to put a card in, but the card doesn't need that connector, and Really, if you're running a lot of machines, if you're a, a serious collector, I guess you'd say, like, you know, I guess I am because I own multiple machines, then, yeah, really better off buying a module. Like, I don't need to use that. If I want Wavetable MIDI on the Pentium, then obviously I'm going to use the Maui, but if I didn't have that, I'd plug my Yamaha MU90 into it and just set it to TG300 mode, so we get some sound canvas-like sounds, but probably better, because I don't really rate the sound canvas versus... I think the MU's better, personally, but to each his own. You know, if I wanted a sound canvas, I could plug that in. But there's the thing, I finished playing with the Pentium, I want a wavetable on my 386. Well, I don't have a wavetable card in there, hell, I don't have a wavetable header on that, because it's a Sound Blaster 1.5 in there, but... Oh, I got a mini port. Boom, stick it in. Oh, well, we got that. So, yeah, the modules are a little bit more expensive, but the, it pays off because you can use it with more than one machine. You can just unplug it, plug it into that one. It's economically, it makes more sense. The, the initial outlay is higher, and yet the, you know, the, the reward is, is higher than that. It, it offsets it quite quickly. It's, that's my, my feelings on these things. But yeah, I, I don't think there's really much else to go on. Well, there is, but I'll be honest, I don't think it needs talking about. We've said what there is to say. We know which card I think's better. I'd like to know which one of the two you think is better, quality-wise, compatibility-wise, whatever. You know, obviously, if you've used these, I'm sure pretty much mostly has probably used the Sound Blaster 16, I would think they're... Well, they were a bundle. I don't know if they are now. I'm, I'm out of the loop because I'm... I don't really buy stuff anymore. Like I've I've got pretty much everything I ever wanted in this hobby now. It's it's really weird. It feels so strange. Like it's sort of setting in, and it's like, oh man, this is weird. What do I do now? Uh, 
took a long, long time. It took a long, long time. Uh, I don't even want to know how much it cost. Like what I could have bought with what all this collection has cost over the years. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think about that. But yeah, it was worth it. It's fun. But you know, like, we learned a lot from this, and we're still learning shit. So yeah, it's it's, it's been worth worth the time and money and effort, I guess. Oh, but I was like, yeah, you know, I, I imagine you've probably used the Sound Blast 16. I, I think a good bunch of you probably have used the past 16. So I don't know. Let, let me know your opinions on these, uh, as usual, I guess. But anyway, yeah, I really should get out of here. I am ranting and ranting and ranting. I don't care, but my voice is starting to hurt, and I, I want to finish what I'm doing before I have to sleep. And yeah. You're hearing some music, that's from a, a genuine 90s pirate intro thing. Some of the best OPL2 music I've ever heard. It's one of the only times you will hear a filter sweep on a OPL chip. Like, it's a simulated filter sweeps that are in there. So, I'm uploading that separately. I'm just gonna upload it next to this. If you wanna listen to that, rendered on the past 16, of course. Uh, you'll be able to listen to that and see what the intro looks like. It's from the last of the Dragon discs that were released. Uh, Dragon, I think, was probably just one guy, and I, it seems they were British. Uh, those discs have all the stuff on them, are really useful. I've got list files of what was on them and everything. I, if I could dig the discs up, I wouldn't even be able to distribute them, unfortunately, because they are piracy, but they're, they're an interesting relic of something nobody really talks about. But yeah, I really am out of here now. So, I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw up. Lord DOS 622.